Okay, next we will hear from Dr. Thompson. So good morning, everybody. If I could have your attention, um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so we have one more um, presentation between you and your official break. Um, I know you did just get your icebreaker paperwork and I'm gonna help you out a little bit. Um, while I don't have a colorful pair of socks on, um, I do speak a foreign language and I was originally from England and I speak British English, so, or I did. So you can put that down uh, on your icebreaker break, if you like. So I'm helping you out a little bit there. So um, I wanted to spend the next 20 to 25 minutes or so talking about um, another surveillance initiative that we have uh, in long-term care and specifically nursing home facilities here at, at CDC. Um, and I'm actually presenting um, today for a short period of time, tomorrow and again on Thursday. Um, and really today's session is to help you understand a little bit more about this uh, additional surveillance system we have and the types of data we collect from it and how it is different to um, and how it actually complements um, the NHSN system that, that you all use. Um, so I'll start um, by telling you that uh, this is a, a point prevalence survey, um, which if you haven't used this approach for doing surveillance, you probably won't understand what any of that means. So I'll try and explain. Um, so, as uh, Dr. Bell had shown you earlier, there are different ways to collect data. Um, there's incidence data that you get from um, the NHSN, and that tells you what your risk of getting a new infection is over time. Um, a prevalence um, measure tells you more about what's happening at a designated point in time. So, the example that Dr. Bell gave you was using that um, CMS, MDS data for the burden estimation it was looking at in the final quarter of a given year, how many people had a certain type of infection. Um, and, and survey in this context comes from statistical survey methods where really we're taking just a sample of people, we're not including everybody. Um, and I know that the word survey has very different connotations within uh, the nursing home setting in the United States. So this is very different to um, a survey that you um, might receive at a hospital from the CMS. Um, so I'm going to abbreviate this terminology point prevalence survey throughout this presentation as, as PPS or, or maybe PS. So just uh, be aware of that. So this is a point prevalence survey of healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial use in U.S. nursing homes. And this was really um, more of a, a, a project that we did um, to, again, help collect data on HAIs and antimicrobial use to, to support and supplement what we already know and what we're learning from the NHSN. Um, so just as a, as a reminder, or for those of you that may not be aware, there are different measures of disease frequency, and the two that you have heard about already today are incidence and prevalence. So an incidence or an incidence rate gives us a, a measure of what are the new cases or new infections in a population under observation over a given time period. And it's really that over a given time period and these new infections that give us a sense of what is the risk of requiring a, a new disease or a new infection uh, over time. And so example of a measure that gives you an incidence rate is one that comes from NHSN and hopefully some of you are familiar with already, which would be the number of urinary tract infections per 1,000 resident days during 2019. The prevalence rate, so prevalence, is the existing cases in a population at a given point in time. And this tells you how widespread an infection or a disease is. An example of this would be, let's say, on today, we want to know how many people in nursing homes um, on July 9th, 2019, have a urinary tract infection. So slightly different measures give you different information. And what I'm going to be talking about here today is um, prevalence and prevalence rates. So the point prevalence survey or, or PPS of healthcare associated infection and antimicrobial use really is designed to provide a one day snapshot in a facility at a given point in time. 
Um, and this type of method or approach to doing surveillance has been widely used um, throughout the world. And we do have some experience with it here in the United States in long-term care facilities through the U.S. Veterans Affairs Department. So they have a cohort of about 130 community living centers, which really are their types of nursing homes. And they've conducted uh, prevalence surveys in 2015, 2017, and two, uh, 2005, 2007, and 2009. Um, and some of this work has been published, and you can go find it um, published in journals. Um, the European CDC, so our counterpart organization in, in Europe, has also conducted a, a number of different um, uh, prevalent surveys in multiple different countries throughout Euro Europe with many thousands of long-term care facilities included. And those have um, been done in 2012, 2014, and 2016. And again, this, this work is published and available um, for people to read. So uh, a long history of using this type of approach for um, healthcare infection surveillance in not only acute care settings, but also in long-term care settings. Just to give you a, an example of the types of information that we might learn from a prevalence survey, and this is a table taken from um, the Department of VA Community Living Center survey that they conducted in 2007. And so really this table here on the slide represents a ranking of the different types of uh, healthcare infections that they looked at, how many people um, had these nursing home onset infections, what percentage of all um, the infections there were that were associated with this type, and what the point prevalence is. So really from looking at this table, um, I can see that symptomatic UTI was the most common type of uh, VA onset infection that was included here, and it comprised 30% of all of the different infection types that they had. So it allows you to get a ranking of which types of infection are most common, which types of infection are least common. Some of the attributes of using um, the prevalence survey method are that it's time-limited surveillance activity. So usually how these things are set up is there's a planning phase, there's an implementation phase. For an, a given facility, all of the data co collection occurs at a given point in time surrounded by, um, which is associated with a survey date for that type of facility. So unlike your NHSN surveillance, which is ongoing and requires you to participate and collect data from month to month, this happens one time to get a snapshot uh, and then it's done. Uh, this type of survey, um, because it's done at a given point in time, allows us to look for a, a variety of different HAI types rather than focusing on a single HAI type. Um, and in this particular survey, not only did we look at healthcare associated infections, but we also looked at antimicrobial or antibiotic use and, as well. Um, it rapidly provides data for analysis and feedbacks, and I have rapidly in italics there because in the world of surveillance and data collection and data analysis, you're probably aware that nothing really happens that rapidly. But in the grand scheme of things, we can get a lot of information relatively quickly, look at that data, understand it, and, and publish results. Um, and when these surveys are performed serially over time, so as I had shown you in the example from the VA, they did a series, um, series of surveys two years apart, it can help you understand are there changes in, uh, happening over time. So uh, is the prevalence of, of infections in this setting increasing? Is it decreasing? Um, you may also find out which types of infections are most common, and it can tell you if there's a change in the rank order. So it may bring to your attention infection types that you weren't previously aware of or, or looking at. Um, so this slide is and this timeline is really just to show you CDC's history of doing nursing home prevalence surveys for HAI and antimicrobial use. So we started out in 2012 um, with planning. Um, in 2013 and 2014, we conducted a small-scale pilot of nine nursing homes in four states, and this really helped us test out um, our data collection forms, the methods that we're using, and understand what changes might need to be made in order for a larger survey to be successful. We then followed with a couple additional years of planning, and, and really in 2017 was the first full-scale uh, prevalence survey that we conducted. Um, and this was performed in 161 nursing homes um, across 10 different states in the United States. The primary objectives of doing our prevalence survey were to measure the number and proportion or the percentage of HAIs and the different HAI types that occur within nursing home settings. 
Um, and we use for this the revised McGeer criteria for residents in long-term care, which I presume you're all familiar with, um, at the very least from using the UTI definition, which is in NHSN, which is based on that revised McGeer criteria. Um, the other objective we have is to identify the number and proportion and the types of antimicrobial drugs that are being used in nursing home residents. Um, and I just want to make the point really quite clear for people that these are two separate outcomes. So we have, on one hand, the number of people that meet an HAI using the standardized revised McGeer definitions. And then on the other hand, we have the number of people who are receiving an antimicrobial drug for an infection. Um, and these two groups may not always overlap completely. And to illustrate this point for you, um, this is a figure that was put out by the European CDC from one of their um, HAI and AU prevalence surveys. So the green box here represents all of the long-term care residents that they had included in their survey, which was just over 77,000. Um, the small square box, which has the blue top, represents all of the people that met an HAI definition. So in this survey, it was 2,626. Uh, the larger purple box represents all of the people that were receiving a drug uh, for, uh, for antimicro uh, an antimicrobial drug, um, and that represented 3,367. So immediately you can see there that there were more people that were receiving um, an antimicrobial for an infection than there were that met the surveillance definition for HAIs. Um, and then you can see kind of the brown box in the middle which represents the people that met an HAI surveillance definition and were receiving an antimicrobial at the same time. So we have people in three groups. We have those that have an HAI that weren't receiving an antimicrobial. We have those that, were, uh, that had um, an antimicrobial but weren't, didn't meet an HAI definition. Um, and then we have in the third group, those people that had both an HAI and an antimicrobial. And I think it's really important that you start separating these things out and realize that not everybody that receives an antimicrobial drug for infection will automatically means that they have met or will meet an HAI surveillance definition. So a little bit about the methods here so you can understand how this prevalence survey that we conducted in nursing homes in 2017 uh, was performed and implemented. So we have here at CDC a program called um, the Emerging Infections Program, or EIP. Um, and this is a collaboration between CDC and 10 state health departments and some of their academic partners. Um, and so we work frequently through the Emerging Infections Program to do surveillance for a variety of different healthcare, associ healthcare associated infections. Um, the EIP staff within these 10 locations are highly trained surveillance officers. Um, they do HAI and antimicrobial use data collection through retrospective chart reviews. That's what, what they do day in and day out for a variety of different projects. Um, they're experienced in doing prevalent survey methods and the data collection approaches. So they have done uh, surveillance, prevalent sur point prevalent surveillance in acute care settings previously. Um, and the other key thing is that they're located near to the nursing homes that were being recruited from this project. So it's much easier for us to work with the EIP surveillance offices to go out and identify nursing homes that want to participate and recruit them than it is for us to do that from centrally in Atlanta. So within each of the EIP sites, the staff um, implementing the project were responsible for promoting the project to nursing homes and then recruiting nursing homes to participate. Uh, they performed, the EIP staff performed the majority of the data collection and applied the HAI surveillance definitions. So again, this is an instance where what's happening here is quite different from what you do for NHSN surveillance, where somebody within the nursing home for NHSN is responsible for collecting the data, reviewing charts, filling out forms, and entering the data into the NHSN system. In this approach, we actually have trained surveillance officers from the EIP site go to a facility, they do the chart reviews, they fill out the forms, and then they enter the data into, uh, into a system that was designed for this. Um, really, this was done so that it could help reduce the burden of nursing home participation. We know that you all are incredibly busy doing a thousand other things um, above and beyond NHSN or infection surveillance. Um, and so this really helped 
um, us recruit nursing homes by saying, we want to do this work, but some will be coming in to do the data collection for you. Um, and so it increased the likelihood that nursing homes would participate. It also really helped us with ensuring that we had high uh, data quality and that the standardized infection definitions that we use for this were applied evenly by having just a small number of people doing it in these 10 sites rather than multiple different nursing homes uh, doing it for us. So here's the CDC uh, Emerging Infection Program sites. Um, and shown in orange are the prevalence survey recruiting areas. So again, uh, one of the strengths, I think, of doing this type of work through the EIP is that we have quite a lot of wide geographic variation um, in the nursing homes that were available to participate to us. Um, and as you can see in, in some sites, um, so for example, in uh, Maryland and New Mexico, all of the nursing homes within those sites were eligible to participate. Uh, whereas in other, in other states, it were select number of counties that were eligible to participate. So overall in the United States, we have you know, about 15,005 to 600 uh, certified nursing homes. Within these 10 areas in total, we had just over 1,000 certified nursing homes that were eligible to participate in the project. Um, so to be eligible um, for participation, um, a facility needed to be a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility that was certified by CMS. Um, what happened within each EIP site was that um, the EIP site it, it was able to construct a list of all of the eligible nursing homes within their area, and then they randomized them um, and contacted them to participate in the project. Um, and so, again, this concept of randomizing nursing homes to participate helps us ensure that we get a sample of nursing homes that may be more likely to represent nursing homes nationally, rather than us saying to the EIP site, just go out and contact all the nursing homes uh, where your best friends are, and we think that these people are more likely to participate. Um, so overall, we had a nursing home participation rate of about 55%, which is actually really quite good for a survey of this type. When we designed and planned the survey, we anticipated the uh, participation rate might be around 33%. If I ask you all to sit and think about how many times uh, during the course of a year you may have your cell phone ring and someone contacts you and says, hello, we'd love to talk to you today. Um, would you like to participate in the survey? How many of you say thanks, but no thanks or, or hang up? A lot of you, right? So it's a lot of effort to get somebody to participate uh, in something like this that takes their time. I, I think the other thing to help put this in context is um, the census that we do, uh, that the U.S. government conducts every 10 years, is a, a census. It's designed and intended to include everybody in the United States. Even the U.S. census in 2010 had a participation rate of 75%. So 25% of people declined to participate. Um, so again, the reason we track, we randomize nursing homes and we track participation rates is about representative and trying to ensure to the best of our ability that we get a group of nursing homes that participate in this that can represent what nursing homes look like nationally. At the resident level, it basically, if a resident was in the facility at 8 a.m. on the date of a survey in a given facility and was also there for the entire day before, then they would be eligible to participate. So essentially we were screening out people who were very, very newly admitted to the nursing home um, because we assumed that there would likely be not a lot of documentation in their chart that would be very helpful for us um, to complete the questions that needed to be collected. Um, and in general, more than 98% of nursing home residents in a facility on a given day were eligible to participate. Uh, this slide is really just a, a, gra a graphic overview of the data collection for the entire project. Um, so again, this, this data collection occurred during 2017. Um, at the beginning of the year, beginning in March, we started with nursing home enrollment. And so this was EIP staff contacting the nursing homes within their geographic area, um, providing them some information about the project, um, and how the data were going to be used and what, how we plan to use it um, and ask them to participate. Um, the nursing home survey dates, so the point prevalence survey dates, began in April and extended out through October. 
So each nursing home that participated had their very own survey date, and they were able to select that date with the EIP site. Um, and then data collection began soon after the survey dates and ran through uh, the end of December. And again, all of the data collection, or most of the data collection for this project was being done by EIP offices. So just to give you a sense of the types of data that were collected, so the first thing we had was a healthcare facility assessment. This was very similar to the NHSN annual survey that gets completed um, as part of your uh, participation requirements. So each nursing home completed one of these. The data was collected by the nursing home staff. So it was a series of questions um, at, that uh, the director of nursing or the uh, IP within a facility completed. So it was information about how many beds is your facility, what types of services are provided, um, and what are your infection control and antibiotic stewardship programs like. For each resident who is eligible within the facility on a given survey day, um, data collected by EIP site staff included things like age, race, and gender. Is this resident a short-stay resident? So are they here to receive post-acute care rehab, or are they a, a traditional long-stay nursing home resident? Do they have diabetes? Do, what's their mobility like? What types of in, invasive devices? So central lines, urinary catheters, ventilators, um, and then information on wounds and pressure ulcers. So that data was collected on every person who was in the survey, in a facility on a given survey date. We also collected information on antimicrobial use. Um, for, so for each eligible, elig eligible drug that was taken by residents, we collected the name of the drug, the type of it, the reason it was given, and what was the planned duration for it. Um, and then the infection data using revised McGear was, um, again, for each resident in the nursing home, it was, does this person show signs and symptoms of having an infection at the time of the survey? Um, and again, we used the, the various categories of revised McGear. So urinary tract infections, respiratory tract infections, uh, soft tissue and wound infections, mucosal infections, gastrointestinal and systemic infections, which was mainly bloodstream, it's a bloodstream infection and, and sepsis. So again, we're looking at a, a multitude of different infection types uh, using this approach. So I'm gonna give you just a little bit of information about the results today, but as I had mentioned, there'll be more information tomorrow um, related to urinary tract infections and additional information on Thursday about the antimicrobial use. So we had 161 uh, total nursing homes that participated. Uh, within those nursing homes, there were just over 18,000 beds. The census, the resident census, at the time of the surveys were conducted was 15,768. And of those, the vast majority of them were what we considered eligible residents. So they were in there at the time of the survey and they had also been there the entire day before. So 15,270. Uh, 76 residents were included in this. So among uh, the characteristics of the nursing homes, the mean number of beds was 113. Um, the mean number of resident rooms was 71. The average daily census uh, was 99. The mean number of attending physicians that worked with that facility was 3.6. The mean number of days a week that the medical director was in the nursing home was 1.8. The mean number of years uh, for the IP experience was 7.4, and the mean IP number of years at, the, at that given nursing home that was participating in the survey was, was 2.9 years. Um, the, these are some of the primary care and clinical services that were provided. So the, as you might expect, the vast majority of nursing homes provided uh, skilled nursing or short-term rehab, um, whereas much fewer of them provided um, long-term psych psychiatric at 29%, um, and a very small percentage, 7%, provided uh, ventilator care. The vast majority of nursing homes provided IV infusions using central lines. Um, relatively few, in comparison, um, provided hemodialysis services within the facility. So again, a broad mix of the types of services that are provided, but in general, um, the distribution of these types of services tend to look like um, the picture nationally. So again, gives us a little bit of confidence that the, the types of nursing homes that were participating in our uh, point prevalence survey are representative of nursing homes across the country. 
Um, looking at the NHSN location type. So again, a concept that you should be familiar with um, as you map your locations within your facility to location types. So 47% of nursing homes were in a long-term general nursing unit um, and 17% of nursing home residents were in a skilled nursing or short-term rehab or a subacute unit. Rel relatively small proportions of people were in bariatric or hospice units. In terms of the resident demographics, so what do the residents look like within these facilities? Um, so 17% of residents were less than 75 uh, years of, get, of age, um, which again means that the vast majority of residents were indeed over 65 years, um, and about 37% were greater than 85 years. We had 38% uh, of residents that were male, 72% um, that were white non-Hispanic, 14% that were black, non-Hispanic, 6% Hispanic or Latino, 3% Asian, and 5% other unknown. And again, when we look at um, CMS data that's made available to us um, from data sources like the MDS, our resident characteristics in terms of age, gender, and race do look quite similar to the national picture. So again, giving us some confidence, the data we have from this point prevalence survey uh, may represent what's going on nationally. And in terms of the clinical characteristics, so more than half of nursing home residents that were in these facilities on the date that the survey date was performed were wheelchair dependent or bed bound. 32% uh, um, had diabetes, 20% uh, were considered short stay, so that sub post acute care population. Um, 5% had uh, urinary catheters that were considered indwelling urinary catheters. 2% had other types of urinary catheters. Um, central lines were quite low, again, at 2%. So giving you a sense of what did the residents look like within the facilities uh, that participated in the survey. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about um, how we plan to use um, the data that has been collected from this survey that was conducted in, in 2017. And again, I think uh, this graphic shows quite nicely that we collect the data to inform us and provide us with knowledge, but the ultimate goal is to use this data for, for action, um, as we've already heard this morning, and really that's the goal of all of the data collection that we do here at CDC, is to actually use it to improve practices um, and spur action. So in terms of the nursing homes that participated, each nursing home received a summarized uh, summary of their data in a facility feedback report, um, and this really helped the nursing home identify what appropriate next steps there might be, whether it be in the realm of infection surveillance to help them establish or grow their infection surveillance program. Um, think about what infection prevention activities might be suitable based on the characteristics of the residents within the nursing home or the data that they had, or what types of antibiotic stewardship activities might they be thinking about that could help be informed by the data that was collected. Um, for the EIP states um, that participated at the state health department level, these data were helpful in terms of providing local and regional data on healthcare infections and antimicrobial use um, in nursing homes that they may not already have. Um, the participation of the state health departments through EIP um, helped them establish and strengthen their relationships with their state-based nursing home partners. So as part of this project, they did outreach to nursing home corporate groups professional organizations and state quality imp improvement organizations, which really, again, help connect um, the dots between some of these types of uh, facilities around their nursing homes, the state health department, and some of these other professional organizations. It provided new opportunities to bring nursing homes into existing state HAI surveillance. Um, so while many of you here are already active and participating in NHSN, there were nursing homes that participated in the point prevalence survey that weren't, and this gave them an opportunity to engage in some of those activities. Um, and then I think the other thing is that um, the state health departments had a lot of lessons learned from working with um, their nursing homes that they were able to share with other state health departments. So again, in improving information and knowledge um, and then sharing that with others. At the federal or at the national level, um, this survey will help provide um, essential descriptive data on the epidemiology of HEIs and antimicrobial use in nursing homes. Um, and again, I think 
Um, one of the strengths of this type of work is that we include all of the different types of HAI that are included in Revised Magir. Um, so it's not focusing on a sp specific in infection type. Um, and this will help us develop an approach to estimate the national burden of HAIs um, in the United States. So as Dr. Bell had shown you earlier on, there were some papers that had been published in 2000 and, to, um, and another one based on data from 2013. Um, and that data is, is quite old. It doesn't rely on standardized case definitions for identifying uh, infections. And so here we have another type of data collection where we have a geographically diverse group of nursing homes that participated. We used standardized infection surveillance, and we hope to be able to use this data to forecast uh, if this is what we saw in a group of nursing homes uh, in 2017, what might the national burden of HAIs look like within nursing homes. Um, informing developments to CDC's NHSN surveillance for long-term care facilities. So by doing this type of work, as, we sh as I showed you from the table in the VA data where it gave a rank order of these are the types of infections that are most common within nursing homes, we can now use this data to understand, well, are urinary tract infections the most common type of infections that occur in nursing homes? What other types of infections um, occur and that maybe we should be paying attention to? So this data will help us inform perhaps what comes next in NHSN long-term care. It can also be used to identify um, risk factors um, that might be used for adjustment of your surveillance data that could be helpful for improving benchmarking and saying, how am I doing compared to other nursing homes that, that look like me? It's going to help identify antibiotic stewardship priorities um, for nursing homes and then also help with the, form, the design and implementation of additional nursing home-based projects um, that have yet to be um, developed. So just in is a quick summary here, um, prevalent surveys provide a quick and efficient approach to obtain data on HEI and antimicrobial use. Um, and these types of data are intended to be a complement to the existing NHSN uh, surveillance data that you all participate in. Um, it can help inform public health action um, at the nursing home, the state or regional and the federal level. Um, and we have had um, some work published from this um, prevalent survey, some of which you will get to see tomorrow and Thursday. And we have other planned publications for later this year and in 2020. Uh, these types of activities are most useful when performed serially over time. Um, and right now we're evaluating when we should perform um, the next prevalent survey. And that will give us, uh, we'll have one reference point in 2017, and then we can look again um, at a later time period and see what's changed um, during, during the period uh, between the two surveys. Um, and they're typically done, CDC has typically done them at every five years. Um, so hopefully in the next couple of years, um, you will hear from some of us that participate in the Emerging Infection Program, um, maybe approach to participate in a subsequent survey. Um, so I do want to acknowledge the 161 nursing homes that participated in the 2017 point prevalence survey. And so while uh, most of the data collection was done by the EIP surveillance offices, uh, actually um, granting access um, to the data, um, and helping those surveillance officers um, with their data collection was, was really important. And obviously without nursing home participation, we have uh, no data to be collected. So a huge thank you to those groups. And then also to the staff of the 10 CDC EIP sites um, that helped with this project as well. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if folks have any. So basically, we'll talk more about um, the methods for doing the AU uh, on Thursday. But basically, we just include any drug that somebody is receiving at the time that the survey is done. So it, it's very clean and, and very objective in terms of what we include or exclude. Sure, there's another question. have those issues maybe not be tracked 
uh, may not be tracked and they are off the grid then. So in North Carolina, there's a big disparity in the amount of money that it costs to go to some facilities in North Carolina. And um, at, my husband has a master's in public health and he's always says to me, Barb, we are going to age in place, right? Because we don't, we can't afford the millions of dollars that these facilities want. So the problem is for North Carolina, if they get a UTI, is that tracked through home health? Is that tracked through um, public health? How are, we, how are you seeing, and we have migrant workers that are treated that don't wanna give their names. And so we have a lot of people off the grid, basically. So I think the numbers would be higher, actually, to be honest with you. So does that make sense? I mean, I'm sharing It does, I think you're doing a very nice job of- Because community health centers, my husband works at one, they track and they have a pace center and their pay center is a, an adult daycare. One, they have two of them. They are adult daycare. They are federally funded. So I don't know where all that goes <laughs> to the government. I don't know. But yeah, we're seeing a lot of people that are off the grid. Right? Yeah, I think you're doing a very um, nice job of explaining the complexities of, of healthcare delivery um, in the United States um, and all of the different factors that may play into where somebody ends up receiving care or not receiving care. Um, so I, I think that um, one of the points um, I'm trying to make here is that you, um, there is a group of people here in this room and on the line that participate in NHSN surveillance for, for long-term care facilities. Um, and, and what is important and, and very useful to do is not only look at one data source in one way over time. Um, and so the point prevalence survey is an approach that CDC um, has used um, to be able to collect additional data that's collected in a different way through a different system and to look at these things together. And by looking at different data sources collected in different ways can help build your confidence in the picture that we're getting. Um, there are, um, as Dr. Pollock um, presented and alluded to, many different pieces of the NHSN system. There's NHSN for uh, acute care facilities. There's NHSN for inpatient rehab facilities. There's NHSN for long-term acute care. So there is coverage um, for infection surveillance in these different facility types. And again, by putting all of this data together, it can help us understand more completely the big picture, there are still gaps that, that exist, of course, as, as some of the examples um, that you gave. But I, I think um, what your point has kind of helped me um, make the point that, again, it, it's really useful and, in fact, quite important to co collect data in different ways, um, and but to look at them together and understand what is it you're learning from one system um, that you're not getting in another and understand what improvements can be made. But again, there's no perfect single universal system that's going to tell us um, everything we need to know. Um, and so again, putting these things together helps with some of that. But thank you. I think that's a, a really important point to make. Any other questions at this point? Okay. And I will be back tomorrow to tell you more about uh, HAIs and urinary tract infections from the prevalence survey. Thank you.